So we actually, I don't know if we know it yet, but we have a lot of things in common. And I'm going to take us back to our youth, Rick. You ready? Oh, I'm cool. All right, here we go. What got you into, here you go, drum corps, DCI drum corps. Oh, yeah. What well, got I was you in that, school man? band. I was in high school band. So um, who's your core? Well, back in the day, I followed. Um, I was a Madison Scouts, Cavaliers. That's my uh, core, Madison Scouts. Yeah. Madison Scouts, man. Yeah. yeah. Bridgman, 27th yeah. Lancers. Yeah. Um, I remember the first year Spirit of Atlanta came in. I, yeah, know, me too. And um, I had friends marched in Phantom. I had friends march in uh, Marion Cadets and uh, Canton Bluecoats. So. Yeah. My uh, When I was in high school, our drum teacher, so we had two uh, – uh, teacher we had the main band guy and then his uh, assistant's not even right he was, he just did percussion um he ended up becoming the the main teacher there but he used to march in the kilts remember the kilts i do i do yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but i can remember one uh year at band camp this guy came in to teach trombones which i i, I was a trombone guy and he he was from madison scouts and so because I knew him, I just like, that's my core from now on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I I used to go see him live, one of the most fun things live. Um, but I have it in years. I, I threw it on, you know, every so I know like on PBS, they have like the and yeah. you know, yeah. And um two or three years ago, I threw it up. I hadn't watched it in years. And I'm like, what is that? Is this <laughs> So it's different. It's like back in the day, it was, yeah, it was. Great. Yeah, but it's just like the same guys win it every year. Every year right. Wow. It was the Santa Clara Vanguard. Santa Clara, yeah. Yeah. Garfield and, Cadets, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Blue, and, Blue Devils, yeah. Blue Devils. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's okay, I guess. But uh, I don't even know that Madison finished in the top 10. Maybe yeah. last year they did, but I, 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 I don't, it's hard to catch it because PBS, I don't even know if they still carry it. I don't know. Yeah, I. I played saxophone and our uniforms were blue and white, but they looked like Madison's uniform. Oh, cool. And then I was, I was drum major my senior year. Ooh, how about that? That was fun. That was right. I wanted to be drum major. Didn't get to. I auditioned for it. <laughs> yeah. But they said, how about you just stick to playing trombone? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what they said. <laughs> so sticking with music, sound. Yeah. I know you are a big fan of ASMR. Yeah. So help. I, and so I didn't know what, until listening to your podcast, really, I'll be honest, I didn't know what it was. Mm. And as I, you know, as I follow you, um, explain it and, and what it does for you. I know you talk about on your podcast, yeah. how it's meditative for you. And so uh, help me understand some of that ASMR. Well, I have a history of it. It's actually a physical manifestation or a physical sensation, I would say. And I didn't know it was a thing for years. But all I knew is when I was a kid in school and a teacher would say, you know, I was having problems with something and she would say, come up here and I'll explain it. And so everybody was studying and the teacher would be showing me something and whispering. And I would just be like, <laughs> you know, I can't. So. Uh, if I go all the way back when I was, I had to be five, five years old or something. And I had a sister, my young, my youngest sister was probably two, if that. And we would play little games as siblings do where I was her, her cat and she would lead me around on a collar. I still play that game, but not with my sister. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, but she would lead me around like her kitty and she would take right. me into, um, I don't know if it's my bigger sister's room or whatever. And she would pretend like she was brushing my hair and putting makeup on me, whatever a two-year-old would do to a kitty. And she would whisper the whole time. And I just remember my body, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I was so much into the whispering. And that's ASMR. It's just like this physical sensation. And then um, I think it was around uh, 2012 when I, I think uh, This American Life podcast did a a feature on it. And it was the first time I knew it was a thing. And I, I actually reached out 
to the person who did that uh, story on it on America Online. I mean, um, America, This American Life. And I was like, this is amazing. I didn't know it was existed. She said, yeah, here's what you need to do. Go to YouTube and look up all these videos. And I went there and my mind exploded. I had no idea. And I have to say what, what is passed off as ASMR on YouTube is not a real ASMR. There's aspects of it. It's, it's really just how to relax. But, and I wrote a blog post about it on my, um, on my, on my um, page about how I really believe the sensation is connecting to the same neurological areas in your body that meditation does and i really believe that asmr is a form of meditation or can be a form of meditation and i use it as that all the time i can listen to asmr and just come to complete silence in my myself and i just i get the same if not better sometimes connections inwardly as i do if i'm meditating so uh, but I love it. It's my, it's one of my favorite things. I, I haven't stopped listening. Well, a couple of times I'll miss something at night, but it's almost always how I put myself to sleep. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, I think you're right, because I know like in yoga, they have, you know, these healing sounds and they have, you know, sound bowls and yeah. all this meditative stuff. And yeah, so I started looking into it and I see what you mean. It's like, it's just this repetitive noise type thing that allows you to, for me, to free myself into just yeah. letting go yeah yeah i think there are two aspects of it there's a relaxation aspect and it can be very relaxing but there are some people that it actually becomes a physical sensation yeah. so my wife has the exact opposite whatever like synesthesia or something like that yeah. and that may be the wrong word but it's where sounds little sounds just completely irritate her right. especially the sounds of me <laughs> and um so she can't listen to it at all. And I have dated two or three people since I found the ASMR that I, I like, oh, listen to this. What do you think? And they're all like, no, oh, no, get it away from me. So I've never found anybody. I've got a couple of friends that I know who have ASMR and I can sort of share the information. But for the most part, it seems like either people don't understand it or they can't stand it. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it interests me. The, uh, so... Yeah. My first foray into college, my first yeah. attempt, I started in pharmacy, and then that was not my gig. And then I ended up in uh, in a theater department. Mm -hmm. And you were a theater comedy guy. Yeah. Yeah. What? What? What led you to that? And well, I went to a, I went right? to a Southern Baptist college in East Tennessee, and I went to be a minister, and I was there two months uh, when I changed to theater. <laughs> it is about um, me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and my family uh, was not a fan of that. And I don't know, I mean, you can't, there's no way to tell a 19-year-old kid it's not a good idea. And I'm not saying theater major is not a good idea, but for what I wanted to do with it, it wasn't that great. Yeah. Uh, if I could go back, I think I would be a psychology major or something like that, get into therapy or something. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I got into theater and I was, uh, you know, I was a very, very passionate Christian, uh, young Christian, young Baptist Christian at the time. And this was passionate really, Baptist, right? Huh? A passionate Baptist, right? Yeah. I mean, this was really at the time that uh, the moral majority started. So it was really before uh, or at the time that Christianity was becoming politicized. And so um, that wasn't a big thing at the time, but it started becoming, you know, uh, Jerry Falwell and Reagan and all that stuff started really happening during this time. And I got really bummed out about it, but I always wanted, so I, I envisioned myself to be in Christian theater. I was going to be in Christian theater. And then after I got out of college, I was just like, I, I realized that you could lose a job in theater just because your eyes were the wrong color. It didn't matter how good you were. Okay, you know, you didn't get the job, you're too tall. And what other job <laughs> is like that, you know? So <laughs> I didn't like, I didn't like that not having control. So I decided, you know, I, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to get into stand up comedy because I always loved comedy. And um, so I wrote some acts. I went and started doing a performing stand up and I really enjoyed it. But I wanted to be a Christian comic. I wanted to open for Christian bands. I wanted to, 
um, performing churches. And, and so I did that for, I think, eight years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, off and on, I was never like full time with it. But I performed for some Christian bands. And, and so I got every, got to do everything I wanted to do as part of an album. And um, I can remember the last time I was performing, I was at Belmont Church in Nashville, Tennessee. It was a big Christian comedy thing. There were like five, six comics on the bill. Uh, two of them like had national names. And I can remember standing on stage doing Mac. And I, I, just, I just thought, this is not fun anymore. And I never did it again. Yeah. <laughs> I just quit. <laughs> You never thought about going mainstream and just, you know, doing funny bones and any of that? or I kind of started that way, but I was just like, it's too easy to make drunk people laugh. And um, and I will say that that's not necessarily true. I mean, professional comics, um, it's amazing. But you have to do it every night over and over, you know, refine your act. And you just, you're constantly whittling and polishing and taking out single words and putting in words that might be funny. So it's a craft. And... Uh, I don't know. I really like doing sketch comedy. I love improv comedy. I love writing comedy. I still love writing humorous essays and stuff. But yeah. the performing part of it, I just I lost the drive and desire to do it. So, um, yeah. And it, and it might just like, I don't really want to get back into it. And the storytelling thing that I did the other night was closest thing. But I had that same sensation when I was doing my stories. I was like, this is not that much fun anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I might speak public, but not that way. I remember, I mean, you've done the Halloween story stuff. You've done that several years and written yeah. some of that. The, the well, when we were that, doing, when we started the Life to Kill podcast, you know, Sherry and I were like really, really similar people. And um, we both enjoyed stories. She was a writer. I was a writer. We both enjoyed stories. We really enjoyed drama. We we loved reading them and, do, and performing and stuff. And so it was something we had a common interest in. And we were both kind into Halloween and horror. So it's just sort of a natural thing. We were like, let's do this. And it, it was so much fun. It was hard to get participation in a lot of ways. I mean, and, and I understand. So we ended up writing a lot of stuff and performing a lot of stuff. And it just got to the point where we would do, um, we would have submissions and we would get one. <laughs> I think you didn't you write something? I think one, one way back in the day. And it's like, yeah. this, this sucks. I'm not going to ever write one again. <laughs> and I understand that. I want to be entertained they don't want to be the entertainers they was like right. i want to listen i don't want to participate so um but yeah we i did a um <laughs> the most humiliating night of my life probably we leased out a a, a restaurant here a little a, a pub i'll say right it was a, a scots irish pub right and i can't remember the exact day but we sold tickets uh, I sold, I believe, 150 tickets. Well, I say sell, it was free, but it was like we had an Eventbrite page and people go to the page right. and download tickets. And we, we've got 150 of them. And I was like, this is going to be huge. So we got this pub, we set up, we got a sound system. We said we were ready to do our stories. It was the first uh, Kilt of Horrors right. live event. Right. Not one person showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was watching and I'm like I was so <laughs> mad I was so disappointed I I started I was ready to leave and I think I don't remember because my wife or Sherry had come out and say get back in there <laughs> so we ended up doing it to people for people who just actually wandered into the, the pub they didn't know what we were doing so it wasn't at all I, and that was when I just said I'm never doing this again <laughs> it's like oh. yeah where are all these people that showed up right it was just like free, and my wife said, don't ever do free tickets, because people don't honor that. They're just like, I'm not going to go out tonight. I, it didn't cost me anything, so. Yeah, yeah. so uh, this, I took it off my wall from my from my yeah. living room. That's that's yours. It is. And, yeah, it's a piece of your work. So you, you moved to visual art, right? How long have you been a visual artist? Well, I started doing, uh, I started actually, I've always been an illustrator. Um, I will say always, but I mean, doing art and i made a living as a graphic designer illustrator for many many years but i started doing fine art in 2008 right. and um i've been doing it since and then uh two years ago i think um here right outside of atlanta i decided to open my own art gallery and yeah. so it had some of my art and a lot of art it's uh, we have about 25 artists they're all over the south 
Um, they're all Southern artists. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my passion now. I just love doing math. And you travel all over the country doing doing all kinds of stuff. I did. I had a I had a company that uh, we were a theming company for kids. So basically, we would design kids' rooms. And so we got hired by a lot of churches, especially to come in and make their boring space look like Disney World. Right. And and that was my job. And I did that for uh, 17 years, I think. And it was fun. It was tiring. Um, church people are not that much fun to work with sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they really are. But I met some uh, people who should not be in that business at all. And um I, it wasn't always fun sometimes and it was hard and then as i got older i just kind of aged out of this it. it's like it's it hurts to climb a ladder now i don't even want to do that so um i'm 60 i don't want to do this right yeah <laughs> yeah so the gallery just became something i decided to do that i could do the rest of my life that i would enjoy but uh it's hard starting a new gallery so. but it's up and running i mean you've been doing some different shows and stuff out of it. I mean, yeah, we yeah we 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 have a lot of shows, it, but financially, it's it's it doesn't stand on its own legs yet. And um, so you know, it's a typical yeah. artist existence of no money. <laughs> if you're an artist, it's like but that's the artist's life, isn't it? Oh, it is. day to day, I right. I I lucked out so much with my wife. My wife's dad was an artist, and so she grew up seeing how an artist lives, and so. She's sort of comfortable with that. And um, so, she, I mean, she just knows what it's like. And so I don't have, you know, I don't know anybody who would put up the, with the crap the, that I bring into a relationship except her. I mean, it's been, it's just like, if I could have gone um, to the universe, to God, whatever, and just said, design me the perfect wife now, that's what happened. So, you know, I am I really lucky. Yeah. Uh, married on St. Andrew's Day, correct? Weren't you married? That's on right. Day? We we met met on St. Andrew's Day, and a year later, we married on St. Andrew's Day. Ooh. So, yeah, and she still puts up with you somehow. <laughs> you know, she's one of the most patient, funny. Um, just she's just a beautiful person, and um, I really like that. So I, I've been into I've been in a lot of relationships, not all of them, but I'm in a lot of relationships I had where packed with drama and right. and immaturity and and sometimes people who shouldn't be in relationships and right. so I was really getting tired and then I met her and I kept waiting for that to happen and it didn't and so uh it's been of all the relationships I've been in the most fun that I've had so <laughs> we just celebrated uh not too long ago I think eight years I believe I want to say eight yeah <laughs> do the math that's all right that's i right. just stopped counting i stopped counting right we stopped counting a lot of things I, yeah the i remember i mean you're building stuff with churches i remember you did like a noah's ark and you would be in your garage <laughs> sanding a hippo or something and you yeah and yeah i just my daughter and i would watch you as you yeah finished we, the hippo or something yeah, we yeah. did a lot of uh Noah's Ark the one you're talking about was probably the last one I did it was for a pediatrics facility and um they wanted like full 3d animal heads like sticking out and I don't have a I don't have a sculptor um so I do the sculpting <laughs> and I'm not a sculptor so I just had to do it yeah. and um you know it's interesting it was fun and in the end it looked really really good so we were really yeah. happy it did. And watching the process was interesting, especially, I mean, for her to see what you were starting with, a block of whatever. And then <laughs> yeah. as it progressed, you, you could see it's like, oh, look, he's doing this. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. Cool. And I have that block in, in literally in my mind. I'm like, I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> I don't know. So we'll see. And then I just, <laughs> like, you yeah. just do it. And then if there's a mistake, you try to make something out. That's the way I do it. I mean, there are sculptors who are so much better at that stuff than me, but. So uh, in COVID, we of course mm -hmm. were all wearing masks. And my favorite, and the one I always get uh, comments about, is this one. Right? Oh, Scotty! Scotty, <laughs> well, I don't know if you got any money for this. I don't know if you did. I mean, uh, I, don't know where it came uh, from. I don't. I'm sure. So uh, those uh, printing services, uh, you know, I'll get like two dollars or something. Like Mask, yeah. I probably got fifty cents or something. But yeah, it's nice. I, tell, I don't yeah, think I ever saw one. That's great. Yeah, that, I love it. Everybody loves it. Even now, you know, they want you to wear the paper ones. I put this one on over top of it. And yeah, talk about Scotty good. Wallace. Where did he come from? Yeah. 
Well, you know, when I was doing the kill thing, um, um, I my life for a few years was sort of absorbed with kilt stuff and Celtic stuff and all of that stuff, which was fun. And uh, I'm a cartoonist. I've been a cartoonist for many, many, many years. And I wanted to design a cartoon, but I wanted the, the, the substance of the cartoon to come from a character, just sort of a wisecracky character. And there are a couple of those that greeting card companies have that they just put a lot of stuff out. And and I think, um, oh, I can't think of what her name was. Uh, but anyway, there's there's like an old gripey woman and um, I'll, rem I'll remember it here in a second. But anyway, um, so I wanted that. I just thought he would be someone that would connect with both women and men and just find us to make people laugh every day and share and and for a while it was really it did really well and then I discovered it was really hard to write for because he was he was really locked into a certain uh it, it, everything kill and then there's only a few things you could do a few kill jokes and then they're done right so he really I really extinguished my <laughs> my ideas really quick with him and I'm not I don't think I'm done with him I've been trying to formulate some some new ideas and new directions to take him. And at some point I'll, I'll write for him again. But yeah, I, I really wanted to kind of license him uh, to uh, either a greeting card. It, it was funny because I did get a contact from a greeting card company. They wanted a license. I was so excited. And they were like, we want him to, you want, we, we want him to lose the kill. <laughs> I was like, what do you have if you don't have the kill? I don't understand. Well, and he doesn't. He's not wearing pants. That's one thing. Right? I, he's naked, but I—that's the whole humor. So I didn't really understand right. what their thing was, and I was like, "No, I, I'm not going to do that." So um, I don't know. I still would like to license him out to uh, a company that would like to mass produce him, put him on shirts and stuff, and um, and that was sort of the whole. I really designed him as a character that I could uh, merchandise and license and just have fun with, you know. Yeah. It, it's fun. I, I look for. I, I hope you do bring Scotty back because he will. He'll he's come back. Got some stuff. Yeah. 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 So where I, I'll, our origin story. I go back to your the end spring of 2013, and I found you online, and you were coming to the endish of your year in a kilt. Yeah. I, I I saw your blog, and it was then it was year in a kilt. And the original, original, original podcast, the year and a kill. I mean, yeah. And I remember I even I even wrote you an email and you read it online, actually. And um, hey, you've inspired me to do this because I you you were finishing in the spring of 13 and I turned 50 in November. Mm -hmm. And so I did the same thing. You know, I did the year and a kill 50 to 51. Yeah. And it and I, I hear what you're saying. So I'm the kilt guy. I'm the and then you're all things kilt. And I'm like, you know, and I, and you've said on, on your podcast, it gets tiring to always have to be the kilt guy. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was definitely one of the most fun parts of my life. Um, but even now, 10 years later, people still make kilt jokes and kilt references. And there's a lot of people who believe that I wear a kilt every day of my life, which I don't. Um, it was fun when it happened a lot of fun when it happened it was uh it taught me stuff about myself you know because i'm kind of an introvert i'm a performer but i'm an introvert so it's, it's like i have this little compartment of like when i get on stage i can be an extrovert and then when i leave stage i'm me and i'm very much an introvert but i have to go walk around stores and walk around downtown and you're doing it in a kilt and it invites everybody to come up and talk to you and they either want to know what you're doing or they want to share their favorite dirty kilt story or um uh, i was in a bookstore and somebody came up and said what's that song that you you two did and i was just like how would i know this i didn't know who the person was but they saw a kilt and they made a connection with you two who's irish <laughs> Not even started. So, but you get that and you get used to it yeah. and you learn to kind of be more uh, accepting of people in invading your space, which I'm not. And, um, and just being more extroverted. So it taught me some skills that I needed and just taught me ways to be a little more open-minded and accepting. And so I liked it. I learned a lot and I had a lot of fun, but I just knew I, I, I could keep it up the rest of my life. I still wear a kill and I'll wear them out. 
Um, everyone tries to get that feeling, and you know, we'll go to a restaurant. I'm like, I'll, I'm gonna kilt up, <laughs> but I put on too much weight now. My kilts don't fit me. Dang. Which, which is why I have four of yours. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, Rick's getting rid of some of his kilts. Hell, let me buy as many as yeah, I, I do need. I need to get in there and pull up a few more out. I think I got some for you. But, but you were not were you were if I remember right, you were not a avid kilt wear before you started is that correct? i never had a kilt on ever i i didn't know anything about kilts i knew nothing i always wanted one um when i was growing up i wanted to be something exotic i wanted to be italian i wanted to be uh native american you know like kids do you want you want yeah. some kind of romantic or um interesting uh ancestry and i, I just knew i was scots irish which i thought was the most boring thing ever and then i saw the movie far and away yeah. Uh, with Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, and I was like, and that was, it was the history of the Irish people in America, and I was like, wow, that's really interesting, and I really kind of got drew, drawn into that, and and I started having a little bit of pride of my ancestry, and then Braveheart came out, and I was like, holy crap, I had no idea William Wallace, and my my great-grandmother was Wallace, and I was just like, I gotta look into this, I, and I came from um, uh, McDonald Wallace and uh, I got a lot of Irish in in my background and a good amount of uh, Scottish so after I found that out I thought well I, I gotta get me a kilt someday and I I always knew I wanted to do it and then when I turned 50 I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do to celebrate that the kilt thing was just there and at the time I was dating Sherry and I just said I think I want to do that she's like do it and I said I'm going to do it every day of my I, I mean, every day of my 50s, not my life. Year, right. And I think she kind of challenged me. She was like, I don't think you would do that. I was like, I'll show you. I'll do it. And so I got it and I did it. And that's how I did it. So, I mean, it was it was so much fun. It was a lot. Of, I would do it again. I actually thought about doing it again for 60. And I was like, oh, no, can't. Right. Because, it, you know, because if you are doing it every day, you know, we talk about kilting up. But it's not just putting on a kilt. Oh, I got to get the boots. I got to get my socks. I got to yeah. find. I got to find a sporin. And it's yeah. getting dressed is is a little time consuming. Just to well, go at to the kitchen. time. At the time, I was vegetarian, and I was vegetarian at the, to the point where I didn't wear leather, and uh, okay. so I had to make a kind of a moral decision for myself that I was going to start wearing leather because I couldn't find fake leather and I and certainly at the prices and the availability. So uh, it was, it was the moment in my life when I decided to kind of um, uh, go back on some of my uh, um, ethics in order, in order to wear leather. Cause you have to, and even like the straps on the kilter. Right. Leather. So right. where are you going to find a, a, a total, I mean, they do make vegan um, kilts, but so I had to do that and, it, it changed me in a lot of ways, I think, and I'll still wear leather now. I, I guess I prefer not to, but I will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope PETA doesn't listen to your podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, they probably don't. <laughs> but, but yeah, and I'm like you. I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert, and we're yeah, shocking to people when they see us, you know. And you do learn. You learn. I, I'm like you. I learned during that year more about me than I did anything else. And, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And people in my, in your space and um, yeah, not taking, you know, everybody's got something to say about wearing a kilt and um, yeah. And it's but it, learning to deal with people. Even 10 years later, anytime I see a tart and I, I play the guessing game, I'm like, oh, <laughs> let's see what is that. That's a mix or whatever, you know, and, I, and I'm always wrong. I don't know why every tartan I, I always think is a, a, a like a Robertson. I'm like, that's the Robertson tartan. I'll say that to any tartan. I don't know. That's the Robertson. That's a Robertson. It's it's got oh, it's 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 the ancient Robertson. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. yeah. And then of course that got you into podcasting, and and so which is which you do a lot of. Uh, what yeah. what do you enjoy about podcasting? Why well, keep doing it? Well, I'm a performer and it's theatrical and, and that kind of stuff. I always wanted to be in radio. And that's one of the things I never got into much at all. And so it fulfills that. And when I started, you know, uh, again, I, I was in a relationship. And when I started, it, it was um, Sherry and myself. And 
I really liked that kind of back and forth that we had. And so we sort of knew each other pretty well. And then when we resurrected it, I think it was 2016 when we brought it back, um, we had been friends even longer. So that kind of, um, we, we really started developing a good interaction. And then at some point we were like, you know, this would be even more fun if we didn't have to talk about kilts every day. And we still could talk about kilts, but let's just not make it singly about kilts. So we could just be entertaining. We could do other things. And then that's where this epic disaster started. And uh, I feel like for me anyway, I, it was one of the few things I just enjoyed constantly. I never stopped enjoying it. And so um, I think for me, there was a lot about it that I enjoyed. I, I, I think the purpose of me doing the show was to make her laugh. And so we would, you know, I, anytime I would create something and, and she would just crack up, I would be like, yeah, score. So it, that just, that was my goal. I just wanted to, uh, we had such fun talking and doing things. And then um, when that ended, I had been kind of planning on doing a solo podcast for a while. And really I wanted to do something that involved spirituality, but I didn't want to do like a preachy thing. I didn't want to do a, a Baptist, I'm not, I, I'm not what anybody would call a religious person at all, but I'm passionately spiritual. And so I wanted, I wanted something that was kind of contemporary and I, nothing that's holy. And so, um, the time I started the podcast apocalyptic and the title is semi religious, spiritual reference, but yet sort of warped away from it. And I didn't want to do, I didn't want to recreate this epic disaster. And so um, I, I had some ideas and I just thought, let's run with it and see where it goes. So it's just now starting to get to a point where I'm like, okay, I like what's happening. Yeah. So it's like, I can be entertaining. I can do um, some things that are funny and fun and whatever, but I can still interject ideas of just living, trying to live spiritual in contemporary society without being preachy, but just ideas you know i think everybody you know whether you admit it or not everybody to an extent lives spiritually and we all have our different names for it some people you could be atheists and still have a spiritual life and um so i i just think there's a lot of people you know we went through and still are going through some periods politically where it's just like evil nasty rude people are being rewarded and are kind of running the country now. And there's a lot of people who were raised differently. They're like, wait, what's happening? This is uncomfortable. I was told this is not the way to behave. Right. And we're all trying to kind of navigate our lives in that now. And, and me, I definitely am. And so it's just like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> I don't know. Right. And so we don't have a, a foundation anymore. I feel like, you know, I grew up in the church, but I feel like the church has lost its way as a whole, the evangelical church as a whole has lost its way. I have seen so many churches where I just like, they're doing it right. This is what you're supposed to be doing. But I've seen so many churches that are just so money obsessed and they're so interested, more interested in serving their own community than they are the poor, the hungry or whatever. So um, I think they've lost their way. And I don't know, uh, I believe as a whole, the church is irrelevant in society really. They're, they're relevant politically for sure. Uh, but it's like, is that where we wanted to go? So I don't know. I know you can find pockets of uh, uh, churches practicing true spirituality, uh, but I, I don't have a lot of hope for it. I think it'll eventually kind of, um, I think it'll splinter and it'll dissolve as it should, but true spirituality um, will always come to the top. And I think that's that will happen and not in my lifetime, but it, I think it'll happen. Or maybe in our lifetime, you know, maybe this is the time, I think, I'll, I'll use the I, I language, I think it is the time that, I mean, this is what, I mean, and I said, as we were getting ready to come on, you've, you won, you inspired me to do my kilt year, so I appreciate that, but to do this, that, that we, that, you know, I've started, and it's about giving people a voice that, a, a platform to just come on, and because there's platforms for other voices, and I think people like us need to be heard and maybe it's time for us to, we have typically said, Oh, I'm, I'm just not going to speak up. I'm not going to. And maybe it's time for us to say, no, I think it's time for something new to come out 
And um, yeah, so I mean, you you doing podcasts and and especially with apocalyptic, it's you know this kind of let's let's start saying things out loud that yeah you know, heard. yeah. Well, not only that, but I and I think I've made a point of this in the last couple of episodes that I did. But I'm I just <laughs> this is so ridiculous being involved in spirituality as long as I have. Just starting to realize the um, the not. <sighs> how important it is it's embarrassing to say this but how important it is to serve other people <laughs> but th yeah. that's the essence of of, of christianity right. and how did i escape that my whole life and i didn't i understood it but yeah. i always understood it as more of a just being nice it's always being nice to help people you should help people but i never really truly got into the spirituality of, of the idea of when you serve other people, you're literally serving God. It's not a metaphor. It, it's God. And not only that, you are. So you're the same people. We both have, we're both, we, you know, if you're, if you're a person who's practicing spirituality, maybe you are connected with the Christ in you. And the person you're serving is might not be connected, but you could still see it and you could still understand it. And you still understand the Christ in me is serving the Christ in you. It's the exact same person. <clears throat> so for me, and it's the direction I want to go with the podcast is giving people. So I'll be honest, I, I grew up conservative. I grew up, I think I, I probably voted <clears throat> Republican the first few uh, voting terms of my life and I'm the opposite of that now um, yeah. I'm not anti-republican I'm anti uh, <clears throat> mean people <laughs> and for whatever reason it seems right. like right. and I'm not saying exclusively but for whatever reason a lot of people in the um, Republican Party the conservative party have have started I don't know if it's an empowerment thing but it's just like have adopted this attitude of let's Let's be mean to people. Let's let's say we're not afraid of you and and very aggressive and put it and it's like the opposite. You know, Jesus said the meek will inherit the world or the earth, and it's very anti meekness. Um, and I think that'll be going on for a while. But it's just like I have developed this resistance to that, and I've developed um, a dislike of it and a judgment towards those people. And I remember one time the comedian Louis C.K. talking about how he went to uh, the home of a very conservative family one time and started talking with them. And I just thought, how do you do that? How can you do that? Um, yeah. But I think that that's important to understand other points of view, to be able to um, relate to people without resisting them and without feeling feelings of hate or animosity or disgust or whatever. But I also think it's important, and this is something that I want to do with Apocalyptic, is to talk to people who you don't, you know, I always think sex workers. In America, I think we we would see sex workers as like the lowest on the rung, you know, whether it's prostitute or whatever. And we just think that they're morally corrupt. But they're human beings. They have a life, and they, they deal with their spirituality the way. And I just think it's really interesting. I was like, let's let's talk to people who we don't necessarily see as spiritual and find out where they get their spirituality, how do they live, what do they do, what, what's their passion, how do they connect to God, and um, let's dialogue about it. So that's sort of the direction I want to go, and I, and I hope and I think that that's sort of what you want to do, yeah. um, and I think that's interesting, I, I'd say. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, and it gets us into, con you know, conversations with people who differ from us, and who hold different values and but we're all on this spinning rock together and maybe mm -hmm. we should learn to stand on the rock together despite our differences and come to better understanding of each other i mean that's what that's what i i think you're trying to do that's what you know i'm trying to do and yeah and whether they believe in whether it be god is god or just some connection to something bigger than ourselves whatever we want to call spirituality i I agree with you. I think we all have it, but it and it's coming into contact with with each other and and the people we meet on the street and all those people that came up to us when we were wearing kilts and well, I wish I could have 
ask them a question, you know, or whatever. Who knows? Yeah. It's been so long since I've been a non-judgmental uh, spiritual person. <laughs> right. It's something that happened, you know, I think I, I was very much so when I was younger. And something about just getting older, you become more judgmental. I don't know why. Um, and I just found myself in this situation where I'm just like, why am I like this? Why am I judging? I mean, there are definitely people I don't agree with, I don't like, and I think they're they're wrong and they're probably um, harming society with their attitudes and stuff. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just saying as a whole. So, but how, how can I relate to them without judging them? How can I, how, I mean, isn't that what spirituality is? So it's sort of like my, where I am, is I'm trying to return back to non-judgment spirit. There's a threat to my ego, I think, when someone is doing things that I don't agree with. And that's totally not spiritual, but I don't know. I, I, I think I have to come to, you know, I have to come to my place of humility and just go, I, I'm wrong. That's totally the wrong way of looking at it. So yeah. um, just to be able to meet anyone and communicate with anyone with a smile and not yeah. try to force them out of your presence. You know, Facebook's made it so easy to delete people. And I do it all the time. I don't want to read a lot of crap. I think you deleted me. No, you didn't. <laughs> not yet <laughs> but i i started doing that and i'm i'm okay with faith facebook's not the world and i was like when i get up i just want to relax and read dumb stuff and so when people are, are ranting and raving about something political i was like i don't have i don't want to read that and most of the time even friends i delete a friend's family it's like i don't want to read that crap so I delete them off but it's made it real easy to have that feeling of just deleting people from your life Right. and um sometimes you need to i mean sometimes it happens when you just need to do it but um i i feel like for me anyway it's just like can i reach out and try can i not be the per the, the accepting person the open person and just stop judging just like okay if someone's doing something wrong it's not my business can i not just love them accept them and say i will be your open space <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. and that's in that true spirituality really i think so i think you're absolutely right i mean that's to just be open to encountering others where they are and they'll encounter me where i am and and today will be different than tomorrow and yeah and just drive on no absolutely absolutely no i appreciate what you're doing so mm -hmm. where can people find you where where can we find your words of wisdom for the cosmos where can <laughs> all over the internet man Oh, I was just thinking I got like 50 million Facebook pages and websites and all that. I don't know. I, I do a lot of things. And so, um, you know, I got my, I, I have a podcast page, Apocalyptic, and you could listen to episodes on the page. You don't have to subscribe. I love it when people subscribe. Um, listen to a few. If it's what you like, subscribe. If it's not what you like, go somewhere else. Uh, but apocalyptic.com is my podcast. Um, I do uh, my art, Rick Baldwin Studio. I have a lot of my fine art up there. I have a gallery, rec.gallery, that's R-E-K. And that's um, that's uh, my gallery website with a lot of other artists as well as some of my work. And then um, I write about spirituality from my standpoint. And some also some, uh, like there are some of my horror stories from um Life to Kill Horror pay, uh, Time on my regular blog, which is just rickbaldwin.com. And so uh, I'm trying to really direct that a little more spiritual. And I've done a couple of little spiritual videos. They're very rambly, just like you can imagine this conversation. And I'm pretty rambly. But, um, and I plan on doing a little more of those kind of spiritual uh, talks, I guess. And if it's something someone's interested in, they can reach out, they can read it. That's fine. Cool. Well, thanks for sitting down, and it's good yeah. to chat with you. And sure. uh, yeah, hopefully people will check you out and you know give it a try. And if not, you know find your studio or find your blog. And uh, yeah, it just you know it's one step at a time, one breath at a time, trying to make this a better place. So I appreciate the work you do, and I appreciate your positive contribution to the universe. Really. Yeah. Well, I, the same to you. I've I've uh, I, I I know of you from years ago with the, the kilt page i don't think i knew a lot about your work and i found out a, a lot about it recently and i've been very interested in it so um you know good luck with this yeah. it it's sometimes can be discouraging and sometimes 
a, a pain, but ultimately it's really fun. And I think uh, what you do, it's, it's, you have to have fun doing it, but you could really, really touch people with the product, with the content, putting it out there. Cause you just put it out and forget about it. And then who knows, two years from now, somebody could see that and go, you know, I, it woke me up. Something, what, something you said woke me up. And uh, I listened to a, a spiritual teacher who died in 1964. And so he left behind lots of talks. And so I listened to them all and they just, I mean, they changed me and he's been dead all these years. So, I mean, that's one of the cool things about what we do is we just put out content and who knows what it's going to do for people. So good luck with what you're doing. And I, I think it's going to be a really uh, uh, powerful thing for you. All right. Well, and we'll we'll see you on the internet and hear you on the airwaves and all that good stuff. So yeah. All right. Well, peace. Enjoy. I know you got to get to work. So peace. And peace. Yeah. All right, man. <laughs> thanks for having me on your show. Yeah. Thanks.